CPR to help others survive medical emergencies or delivering international humanitarian aid and reconnecting loved ones separated by crisis around the world. And whereas their support, volunteerism, and generous donations are critical to our community resilience, we therefore recognize this month the march in honor of all those who fill Claire Barton's noble words. You must never think of anything except the need and how to meet it and ask everyone to join in this commitment. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Yuba County Board of Supervisors does hereby proclaim the month of March 2023 as American Red Cross Month throughout the county of Yuba. In recognition of the important work done by the American Red Cross, we urge and encourage all citizens of Yuba County to reach out and support its humanitarian mission. There we go. I just, in 1967, I was in Vietnam and they sent me home because of emergency back here. Less than four days, I was home. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Item 105 uh, is eliminated. Uh, 104, receive quarterly update from district attorney, probation, and sheriff's department. This one I don't get to read. <laughs> it's only 20 minutes. All right. All right. I guess I'll get this kicked off. Good morning, Chair. Mr. Arnold, thank you very much for coming before us. Yes. Good morning, uh, board members. Jim Arnold, Chief Probation Officer. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to address the board this morning. <clears throat> when we were first approached, we, meaning the public safety group, about presenting to the board, I thought what a perfect time to start this tradition with presenting uh, probation's first business summary. Um, which gives really a, a deep, um, excellent overview of the probation department. And especially if you don't have a full understanding of what we do, it really gives you a good idea of uh, how we impact the community. Oftentimes people um, don't know the role of probation. Sometimes it's like a square peg going into a round circle. Um, and I think this uh, summary will really give a good idea of how we fit and impact the criminal justice system. Within the summary, without going into great detail, because we could literally spend a couple hours on that summary, um, you will find a framework of the probation department's four main uh, divisions, uh, two of them being adult and juvenile supervision and court investigations, one being victim services and the other being institutions. If I could go back to victim services for a minute, a lot of people don't realize that we're only one of two probation departments in the state of California that oversee victim services. And I could say uh, without hesitation, our victim services group is probably the best in the state of California. What they accomplish uh, is, uh, is a model um, and needs to be an example of how things should be done um, when we service our victims um, in our local counties. Um, they are in an immense uh, group that does great things and um, they are to be admired for uh, the impact they have. Um, also in there, you'll find a brief description of our team center um, our comfort dogs, our past program, which is probation and school success, which is a flagship program of the probation department. It's been around for many years and many counties have um, used it as a role model for uh, their programs. Um, also, you'll find uh, peer support and staff wellness, community support, and a few other um, items in there. One of the things um, that I did not want to put in there, and it will definitely be in the next summary, is our Measure K. 
of funding and the things that we're doing with that. Um, I cannot express enough my gratitude and appreciation for Metro K funding. Right now, it supports five positions within our department that are already having immense impact in our community and our jail system. Um, and also, there's additional monies touching other aspects of the of the probation department. So again, um, I'm extremely thankful um, for the Metro K funding that we're getting. Some other topics that are really um, heavy right now in our department is obviously our new juvenile hall. Um, it's been an over a nine year project, uh, no fault of the county. Um, about 95% of the delay is due to the state, um, but our new juvenile hall is gonna build out an environment that will greatly uh, impact our youth and make uh, their recovery much better. Um, I can't express my gratitude enough for uh, the juvenile hall staff that have put a tremendous amount of time into getting us where we are now and, um, and other community members and uh, county staff that have really put a lot of time and effort into getting us to where we are. Um, we're hopeful uh, we will get the keys uh, in June. Um, the rain is obviously hampering that a little bit, um, but we are very um, optimistic that by midsummer we will have uh, the keys and be able to occupy uh, the facility by the end of summer. Excuse me. Um, another area that we've probably heard a lot about is SBA 23, which is the closure of uh, Division of Juvenile Justice. Um, what that is, is that the state system to house our most uh, violent youth offenders is closing effective July 1. That means those offenders come back to the county. Um, for us, is it an impact? Uh, yes. Is it an impact that we're not ready for? No. Um, we're well prepared for it, especially because of leadership out of our institutions. Um, and so um, it's a huge piece of legislation, um, but it's something that uh, we got out in front of and we're well prepared for it. We had four minors um, housed in DJJ. Um, three of them are going to um, parole or finish their program. And so only one will be coming back to us. But we ha will have other minors um, that instead of going to DJJ out of our court system locally, they'll be housed um, at our facilities. The other uh, area that we have spent immense amount of time in lately is our homeless population. So with uh, Measure K and some other funding, we're able to establish a, um, an officer that will oversee um, our homeless population and also impact um, others that are not um, associated with probation. Uh, so we're excited about the results we're already getting from that. And also with that, we're, we've already developed a community outreach vehicle um, that's being designed um, in the state of Montana. Um, currently we have the funding for that, but we also applied for a grant that we're gonna find out in April if we could totally fund that vehicle. So two areas uh, that I really wanna touch on um, today, um, one being um, the wellness and the health of our employees. Uh, if you look in that summary, it talks a little bit about our peer support um, I cannot express enough how important that is for our employees and for public safety employees in general. Um, their uh, health, their wellness is critical to their success and our success. I think it's no surprise if we look at the papers today and we're reading what's going on in the public safety world, um, our officers are experiencing great amount of trauma. Um, and if we don't get out in front of that and we don't address it and we don't recognize it, uh, we're gonna have staff members that are really gonna be suffering. And so we take great pride um, in being there and creating a wellness program for our staff um, through peer support and other health measures that, that we're trying to create. Um, it's essential to them to address uh, the traumas that they experience uh, to make them healthy. And I'm not just talking about our officers, I'm talking about our probation aides, our intervention counselors, all of our institution staff, our front counter um, folks um, every day, they're experiencing um, clientele coming through our hallways um, that at, oftentimes they're struggling, obviously, and uh, they experience that as well. They feel it as well. So everybody associated with our probation department and in public safety in general need to have a system set up for them to make them healthy. The other part of that and something that probation greatly um, prides itself in and for the 13 plus years that I have been chief, um, 
if there's one thing I want to be recognized for, and it's the only thing that I truly um, feel that is extremely important to me, is that our staff come number one. Um, I care about our staff. Uh, probation has a long history um, believing that we're a family first department. We believe that if our folks are healthy at home and they're getting the support they need, then they'll be healthy at work. Um, you oftentimes hear people talk about the new buzzword now is team, and you, you talk a lot about or hear about or read about other agencies that are using the word team. We've used the word team forever. Um, that's nothing new for us. We are a team. Um, together, all of us achieve more, um, and we believe in that. It's not just a buzzword that we use. Um, it's something that we live by. Um, when we say family first, again, it's just not something that, that we say. It's something that we have proof that we live by. Um, the Yuba County probation employees are the most important thing to our department by far and away. They're the most important thing to me. I love my job. I can't ever recall waking up saying I don't want to go to work, and it's simply because of the employees. I thank them. Um, they make uh, our community um, so much better. Um, they make me better. Um, and I cannot express my gratitude for them enough. Um, again, um, I admire our team. It's your guys' team as well. Um, and I thank every single one of them. It doesn't matter what their title is. It doesn't matter what their responsibility is within our department. It's simply all of them matter and all of them make an impact and make us better. Probation has a long history. Um, in Yuba County for being a department that simply gets it done and asks for little attention. Um, we believe that our sustained purpose is to impact our clients um, through accountability and evidence-based um, resources. Um, we believe that if we could do that, it makes them better, which also makes our community better. That's our goal is to make them better. Um, we believe in relationships, not power, drive us forward. Um, unfortunately, um, I think we've all dealt with entities that they believe that power is the, how you get things done, and simply it's not. It's all about the relationships that you have with people. Um, and we believe in Yuba County. Um, I think Yuba County is one of the finest counties in the state of California, um, and we believe in Yuba County. So lastly, what I would like to do, um, if we go back now, I, I believe maybe in September, October, uh, Mr. Mallon put on a leadership uh, um, meeting out at the Hard Rock um, <coughs> Casino. And one of the things that he mentioned is that we need to understand each other's responsibilities within the county. So we need to understand who, our missions of everybody, not just probation, all the departments. Uh, we need to understand what their goals and what they're trying to achieve. Now, I will say that it was perfect timing for us because the previous uh, CIO, Mr. Bendorf, authorized us to create a poster with our mission on it to get it out everywhere. Um, and so it was just perfect timing. So today I would like to present the board um, with our mission statement that's in a frame and a poster um, so you guys could put it in your offices next door. Um, so I'm not sure how I will, but this is what it looks like, and that's Inglebright Dam um, oh. on the... <laughs> okay. Any kind of questions or I'll wait after um, Mr. Curry or Mr. Anderson finish up. So okay. Any questions from the board? Any comments from the board? Through the chair. Just a quick comment, just thank you to you and your team. I know when I first joined the board uh, and I had the opportunity to meet with all the department heads, uh, certainly my meeting with probation was probably one of the most eye-opening, I think that in health and human services. Um, the fact everything that probation does, I, I really, before taking this seat, thought it was parole and that that was what your team did. And I quickly learned that uh, so different and such an impact that your team makes on the community. So thank you. I appreciate that. Any further comment? Jim, thank you very much for the many years that you've uh, led the probation department and uh, Camp Singers uh, always been a bright spot in. Uh, in thank you. Community. And we can't accomplish that without you guys. So yeah. our appreciation.
back at you guys as well. Thank you, yeah. All right. Hi, Mr. Chairman, members of the board and staff. Uh, Wendell Anderson, Yuba County Sheriff. And before I get started, uh, I just want to say that the partnership that we have, well, that I have with the two gentlemen in their departments behind us uh, is just invaluable for the county moving forward. And um, we rely on each other at certain times. And the fact that I can pick up the phone and call either one of them at, at any time is just a godsend for me. So um, we met, obviously, several times before this presentation. And I think collectively agreed that the presentation didn't give us time to take a deep dive into each department. So, uh, you know, I provided you with a few stats, just a very broad overview, but I'll answer any questions that you have. But the next presentation that we give you will be focused on either Mr. Curry's shop or the sheriff's office. So, um, so while the information right. that I have for you is very brief, uh, you know, the time allocation was a little short. So um, any I don't want to hog up all the time here. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Arnold does, does an excellent job. His staff obviously are uh, doing a, a lot of work over in their department and, and equally at the Sheriff's Department. We have several different divisions and uh, I look forward to showing you some highlights, talking about highlights from each one, from ACS to our investigations unit. So uh, you see the stats in front of you. So we're coming out of COVID, uh, the protocols with COVID. Uh, we're pretty restrictive in our jail. But as you can see, uh, the daily population is continually rising uh, to the point where my jail staff is starting to complain that we're booking too many people. So, uh, <laughs> the, um, so yeah, everybody, and I think Mr. Curry and the courts can attest to this, is that uh, during COVID times, um, everybody that was walking around out in our community had a warrant for their arrests. Uh, or the, the, the wrongdoers did. So we're cleaning that up. Uh, people are going to jail, and, and that's reflected in our daily population. So um, the, the stats, as you can see, uh, from last year to this year, are, have increased quite a bit, about 3,000 reports, uh, for, f given the time frames. I don't know if that's reflective of, uh, I think some of the numbers that we got during COVID were maybe false numbers. People weren't reporting, or more people were home, so you know there, there, there were less thefts. I, I'm not sure, but we're going to take a deep dive into that. And when we come back with some stats at the next quarterly meeting, we'll have some answers for those things. But uh, without a doubt, the numbers are starting to rebound from the COVID pandemic. And that includes our booking. It rec includes reporting. And um, I, we'll, we'll continue to see if that trend continues to move upward. So, you know, hopefully not. Hopefully it's just a, you know, recovery period. Um, I, I truly feel that the numbers that we had during COVID, I know the numbers in our jail were were not, uh, or were due to the pandemic, without a doubt, with the restrictions that we had, the quarantine that we had, and, and uh, we were just unable to lock people up, but that obviously has changed. And with the stats that you have and any just general questions, and like I said, the, the next time I'm in front of you, we'll do a much deeper dive into uh, the different departments, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions from the board? Uh, I have one question. Yep. Maybe I, it can wait till the other presentation, but how are we doing on recruiting more uh, deputies and specifically for the Hills? Yeah, that's actually a, a good question. And, and we're actually doing well. So there's some programs, lateral incentive programs that this board supported ha have worked very well. And uh, this calendar year, uh, we trained, we hired and trained and when I say train, they went all the way through training, 17 new deputies. Um, we we currently have five vacancies in the operations division. Uh, we started the year with 20. So I mean, we're, we're, we're doing very well in the jail currently as we speak. I have zero vacancies in the correctional officer rankings. Uh, so they're doing a great job over there. And, you know, a lot of the work that, that we did with the lateral incentive program was due to our human resources division the board and I, I think it's paying dividends and uh, you know the I won't mention any departments but we've re we've gotten some very very good hires recently from some of our our, our local uh, law enforcement partners and uh, I think it's due to obviously the commitment to public safety in Yuba County but also uh, Jim Arnold touched on it it's that family atmosphere we've tried to uh, foster that with barbecues and, you know, just days for employees, the mental wellness, which is something that is huge for us as well. Um, 
focusing on that through peer support, through mental uh, mental wellness app on your phone, uh, just been tremendous. And word gets out, you know, when you have an environment like that that you can work in, um, it, it's it's been working well in enticing people to come to our department. So, yeah, and we can we can get into the stats of. Uh, Hiring retention, uh, but I think overall we're we're performing at a high level. Good. All right. Any questions? Sure. Through the chair. Uh, thank you, Sheriff, to you and your team. Uh, one quick question, and I imagine you'll get into this maybe deeper uh, when you give your next presentation. But how are the flock cameras working out for your department? The flock cameras are actually working out great, and um, we've uh, re I recently had a couple of meetings, shared some stats with. Um, with Yuba City PD, it looks like they may be going through that as well, or at least they're heading that direction. And we started doing our, our monthly stats online. And if you see our, on our if you follow our Facebook page, it, it tells you how many flock hits we get each month. Um, no, all the hits don't lead to stolen vehicles. Some of them are administrative uh, errors through DMV. We're finding that happens pretty frequently. And, uh, but yeah, they've been tremendous and, and we will take a deep dive into the numbers uh, on the recoveries, but also the assistance that we've had in solving crimes with the flock cameras. So I think it's just gonna continue uh, to serve us well. Great, thank you. Okay, any further questions from the board? Um, I have a question, Sheriff. Uh, yes. Uh, looking around the nationwide, um, tax on officers, uh, morale in departments. Uh, how's, the, how's the morale doing now in, in our department? Our, our morale is doing very well. And I think, you know, if you come, uh, and you can come anytime, do a ride along or sit in on a briefing. Uh, but we have a great group of people and um, they understand the struggles that we have and the legislative issues that we have in our state. And uh, they're focused on their jobs and just doing their jobs. So. And the other things I mentioned earlier, the wellness um, portion of that, having those resources available to our folks, I think creates a good work environment for them. Uh, the family barbecues that we do at the department, um, I, I think we're doing as well as can be expected. And it is a troubling time for law enforcement without a doubt. But I also feel that um, here, especially in Yuba County, we're a little different because we get huge support from the public and they let us know uh, they send us letters, they send us cards, thanking us, uh, and, it, you know, the support that we have in our community is tremendous. I'm sure that helps out that we're convicting a lot more people than normal uh, other counties in the, in the state. Yeah, that's that's the district attorney's I, I, I understand. He is sure, an exceptional job. But it sure helps when uh, when they, they stay in longer than it takes to do the paperwork. So, that's, uh, all right. Any further questions? Any comments from the public? Okay. Thank you very much for your job. Well, thank you. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, sir. So as the sheriff said, we kind of teed up probation to be the, the primary uh, for this morning and we'll, we'll take turns in other quarters. Uh, but I just, uh, I think you already have it in front of you, um, a short, summary of some of the stats uh, from 2022 so just sort of a little check-in with how we're doing in the in the da's office and we are also as the sheriff mentioned we're seeing the increase uh, if you look at the calendar year 2022 uh, just the criminal cases uh, we're up on what's coming through the door um, how much we're getting screened filing and the cases closed was way up and I think that's part of the COVID backlog, uh, because if you remember during COVID, uh, the courts essentially closed uh, and we're just kicking the can down the road. Um, so there was a growth of pending cases and we're starting to work those out of the system. Uh, but it was, you know, tremendous uh, increases for the office as far as just raw numbers are concerned. Uh, and then um, I just gave you some of the really significant highlights. These are just the life cases from 2022 that were completed and sentenced. Um, you know, three strikes is still on the books. Um, California Globe did a, um, let me write a, an article about that one, how it's just still so, so necessary. Uh, there's just some people that, um, are too dangerous to let play in the sandbox with everybody else. 
uh, so to speak, and they've proven it by their their track record. So thankful uh, for my team uh, that just hits these things out of the park. Uh, for those that have resolved by plea agreement, you can just imagine how much time they were looking at that they took a deal for something like 25 to life. Um, you know, the second one, Daniel Solis, that was that was a jury trial. You all remember that. I think it was Linda, um, that home invasion where this this guy just pushed his way into the house and uh, stabbed a 59 year old resident. Um, Chase Hammonds. Uh, you know, ran from the cops and hit a lady head on on 70, uh, well, and killed two. So that one, uh, his exposure was just over 30 to life. So uh, Andrew Naylor did an exceptional job getting a, a plea agreement at uh, 25 to life. And then Rory Banks, that was a super complicated, if you remember that, I was out of Wheatland. Uh, the guy um, looked at the 290 registry picked all of them and decided he was going to go kill all of them in Wheatland. And he got to the first one, broke into his house and murdered him, and then uh, claimed that he was insane at the time. So that was a super complicated trial due to the insanity um, plea. So that was another great result. Uh, my chief uh, did that trial, 60 years to life. And one of the Johnson brothers, who's infamous in our Northern California for doing all those burglaries over a period of years, uh, made the mistake of doing another one in Yuba County, and uh, he went to trial, lost, and is now serving 25 to life. So, like Mr. Vasquez mentioned, um, you know, we're, we're just not going to play in Yuba County, and if the laws are still on the books to allow us uh, to keep the community safe, then we're going to do it. Uh, the last slide uh, is our current staff organization. The um, positions in light blue are Measure K funded this budget. Um, and the ones with the red X's are the ones I'm, I'm looking at not being able to, their current vacancies and um, that's where we may have to back off due to the loss of the ICE contract. So I'll be working with the sheriff and probation and Mr. Mallon to see what we can do um, because it's definitely tough. I lost uh, two attorneys last year and both of them, their primary reason was workload uh, when they left. Um, they're both, you know, in the millennial generation. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure that out as someone who's like, what do you mean the workload? Like, just stay, stay later. Uh, but it, you know, it's a real thing. Um, and of course, numbers are up as well. So any questions? Any questions from the board? I have, I have a question. Is there anything that work can help uh, to kind of uh, keep people more, uh, more people in jail? And, uh, <laughs> no, uh, we're uh, honestly like COVID lifting um, and the sheriff's doing a great job opening the jail back up. Uh, so we're, we're in a better position uh, being able to actually put people in jail for some of the uh, lower level offenses that are real blight on our community. And um, I've started a conversation with the homeless consortium about potentially uh, working into some kind of a homeless court where, you know, it's essentially, do you want to spend six months in jail or do you want to stop declining services and maybe something like that? Yeah, something like that. Um, through, through the chair, just a quick comment, not a question, but, uh, but thank you for uh, how active you are on social media and sharing with the community. Uh, how you're you're keeping the community safe and the prosecutions that you're doing and how they're successful. Uh, and thank you for uh, prosecuting people to the full extent of the law. It's appreciated. Thank you. Mr. Curry, uh, uh, I talked to you earlier about the, uh, the uh, uh, underage application of uh, surgery life-changing surgery in this in this in some of the school systems and I don't know if we have that happening here but I'd like to talk to you later on that because that's the, a big concern anytime you give a 13 year old puberty blockers and a 15 year old double mastectomy there's something wrong somewhere and I just I'm looking for I'm clutching at straws trying to trying to make a dent in that well, so, happy to talk to you about that I, I thank you Question yes, so on the homeless court, I'm curious, is there a specific group among the homeless that you're going to be targeting for that particular leverage? Is it going to be mental health? Is it going to be drug? Is it going to be 
those who have chosen that lifestyle? Like, what's the specific group that you're thinking that will be work effective in? That, that, that's part of what we're trying to figure out. And, and that's why, honestly, I'm, I'm starting with the homeless consortium to, to sit down and say, who, who is the target population that we can go from? You know, uh, they're declining services. They're committing lots of, um, you know, nuisance type crimes, trespassing, stealing shopping carts, uh, petty theft. And they're just racking up these cases, which really affects our community overall, even though they're not violent, they're not serious crimes. I mean, they really affect the quality of life. Uh, so who who is in that window that, uh, you know, with a little bit of encouragement might stop declining services and start taking? Because we know um, both you and Sutter counties are doing a phenomenal job, 14 forward and things like that. Like there are ways out of homelessness for those who don't want to remain in it. And thank you. You're welcome. Um, one other question. Uh, are we having any luck on mental health uh, help? Um, maybe separating from a tri uh, uh, Sutter County and have our own health that, program? On, honestly, uh, that's a conversation above even my pay grade. Okay. <laughs> so. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. For t t please tell your staff thank you for the job that they're doing. It's keeping us all safe out there. Okay. All right. Gives me hope for our community. All right, public communication, I think. Any person may speak about any subject of concern provided it is written within the jurisdiction of the Board of Supervisors and is not already on today's agenda. The total amount of time allotted for receiving such public communication shall be limited to a total of 15 minutes, and each individual or group will be limited to no more than three minutes. Prior to this time, speakers are requested to fill out a request to speak card and submit it to the clerk of the Board of Supervisors. If you're participating via Zoom and wish to comment, please use the raise hand function or star nine of participating on a phone. Please note, no board action can be taken on comments made under this heading. We've got five, excuse me, requests five to cutter. speak cards and no hands raised on Zoom. Who's our first card? Uh, first card is Mr. Philip Morris. Miller. That's Miller. Oh, excuse me, <laughs> Miller. <laughs> Uh, good after, good morning, I should say. Um, what I'd like to talk about is the uh, uh, work being done on the Gallant Parkway. A majority of it is very good. Uh, the sidewalks are coming in good and all that. But there's one section on the uh, north side of McGowan, <clears throat> excuse me, that is being built high. The fences are um, six feet. You take two feet away and you don't have any privacy in those homes. And that's the problem. We got kids walking down, throwing garbage in our backyards, looking over the fence when we want private, when we need privacy. Also, this high area creates uh, an area where the water can't leave. It gets stuck in there and it goes nowhere. And I mentioned this to the engineer and he said, well, we can't do anything about it and it'd be wasted taxpayers' money. And But there can be something done about it. It can be leveled down lower <coughs> where people can't look over into my backyard among, along with the others back in that area. They can't and they can fix it where the drainage will be appropriate in that that specific area. Like I say, the majority of it is good. There's no problem with it. It looks good. It's great. But this area is, for some reason, they just want to want excuse me want to raise that road up or the sidewalk up too high. And if they were to put it down, they would have the drainage. They wouldn't, we would have our privacy and everybody would be happy. Well, I don't know if you've talked to Mike Lee or not. And I'm, I'm sorry. Have you talked to Mike Lee uh, in the building department? Well, I've talked so, to the engineer. Okay. Uh, Got to talk to the man in charge, he, Mike he, Lee. Uh, 
Well, he said that there was nothing to be done. Okay. Let me tell but, you, talk to Mike Lee. He will make sure that he satisfies your, your well, questions. Well, the, the problem is he, he's told everybody that has talked with him that, well, we can't do anything, we can't do anything. But there were people that had trailers. Mike can. That's fine. But I want you to know. Okay. I want my supervisor to know. Right. Uh, because I would like him to come out and see for himself sure. what I'm talking about. Nobody okay. seems, he's been out. He obviously knows what, within reason what's going on, except in this area. And it's, it's important to us homeowners in that area that something gets done about that. I can relate to that. And like I say, uh, you, we, we, we're losing our privacy. Okay. It, well, we have people through the chair. It, it, it sounds like. Would you like uh, staff to to meet with Mr. Miller and yes, then report think, back on an outcome there? Would. Okay. So uh, Mike Lee is our community development director. He, it, Mike, raise your hand back there. Um, so, okay. so it, it, he'll he'll reach out to you, connect, meet out on site, take take a look at the issue, and and uh, figure out a solution, and then we'll report back uh, to the board. As a note, I okay. think this is also the second uh, person who's brought forward the drainage issue on that particular stretch. So he's not alone in thinking that the drainage is a concern. I think the conversation last time was about slope and which way it was going forward or backward, but absolutely seems to be a multiple uh, individuals that are seeing that issue. Thank you. Okay, All right, thank we'll, you. We will do our and best I, to I address. appreciate you listening. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah. like I say, that, that I, I am happy you're doing that particular project. It's been needed to done needed to be done for quite a, quite a while. Mr. Miller, you dropped sure. something there on through the chair. You oh. dropped something on the ground. It's once you walked up. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. You have a good day. All right. Thank you very much for bringing it to our attention. All right. Our next card is from Miss Mary Salvato. Mary, long time no see. You moved out of my district. <laughs> My name is Mary Salvato, and I'm coming before you today about a problem. And um, initially, I went to the building department because uh, this property is like falling into a black hole. I'm being told that it's not under the building department's purview. I'm being told by HCD, it's not under, the, uh, not under the HCD purview. And granted, there's some truth to it because I looked up the actual manual, which is quite hefty, for the 2022 mobile home residency law. And per this thing, it says that it only covers 1976 and older mobile homes uh, in a park. So uh, the mobile homes that are falling into complete and utter disarray in Oliverhurst are not getting any attention to as being um, blight. The property I'm talking about has been there for 25 years that I know of because I've lived next to it. And the lady died and it's become a drug house, it's become a marijuana grow, it's become uh, substandard housing for low-income people. And the, recently the low-income people left because the heater quit working. And right now all the doors are falling off and it's been gutted. And it was, uh, some men had come in in very nice cars and trucks to attempt to rehab this place. I could show you pictures of it. It's a tin-sided shed, 1955 tin-sided shed with wheels on it and corner posts. And the little stairway that you walk up to the door has more foundation under it than the entire mobile. And they were gonna rehab it. And so I came into the building department and made the stink about it. And I was told that there is no coverage in the building department, it's HCD. So I went over and I showed them the pictures and uh, I went to legal and I talked to Mr. Jacozzi. Jacozzi. And I believe he, it was him that may have done something and caused them to send out somebody 
And luckily, the men were there working, I was told, and they red tagged it. And they told him, you need to quit working because you don't have a permit from HCD. So they, there, that's where it is now. And the doors are falling off and everything else. So I, I went a little further and I looked up the Title 24. So, and I did talk to um, a Naisha Gaines, a floor lead at HCD. And she told me that privately property, private property with a mobile home that has been permitted by the county is county area, not their area, because they only cover mobile home parks. And so, um, maybe I can short stop this, Kevin. Um, I, I, I believe we have the information. Uh, staffs received the the, the, the information Ms. Salvato uh, provided the board as well. And so uh, CDSA uh, will get with county council, research the matter, and then uh, present it back to the board because uh, it sounds like there's a bit of a jurisdictional question. Um, what, where's the county's jurisdiction versus the, the state's jurisdiction? And Supervisor Bradford, I, I think you have a comment on this. Yeah, as, as well. yeah, th th through the chair. So Mrs. Salvato also submitted a similar public comment to the RCRC Board of Directors uh, for our meeting no, this she, last no. week. I did not submit a comment to the RCRC. I was directed by Eli Sims to RCRC. And you know, I only have so much time to do so much stuff. I don't get paid for this. So, and, and so I went to the Zoom meeting and I actually spent three hours listening to the RCRC Zoom meeting. It has nothing to do with mobile homes. It deals with a lot of stuff. Homeless, this, that, the other thing. It has nothing to do with mobile home issues. So I, what, what, what um, after receiving that comment as a member of that board, I spoke with uh, county council about um, the issue that was raised by Mrs. Salvato, and, and they did explain to me that there does appear to be a gap between uh, what HCD responsibilities are and what county responsibilities are per the law, and there might be some opportunities to clean that up and to make that clear uh, where those responsibilities ultimately lie. And so... Uh, with the board's, um, Kevin kind of already alluded to this, but uh, with the board's support, I would uh, want staff to take uh, a deeper look into that and report back to us with a uh, potential resolution to that uh, and a recommendation. Because you're not the only one. Okay, okay. This, this problem is pervasive in all of Hearst. These individuals that know that this is a problem are buying up these mobile homes, rehabbing them without permits, and reselling them for big money, but these permits haven't been pulled to make sure the wiring is good. The plumbing is, is. We're going to get together with everything. staff and we're going to, we're going to re-examine the areas that we can, we could look okay. at. I, I want to bring up another issue. When I went in and talked to the building about it, I was treated poorly. I was talked loudly to like, I didn't have a right to come in there and say anything. Well, Mr. Jacozzi was kind enough to do something and stop this problematic property from being pushed forward. I was treated badly. I was told yesterday by somebody in the legal department, I need to get a lawyer to deal with this issue. That your lawyers are for the county, that if I need help in this area, I need to get a lawyer. But I don't understand how this, this is going on. And when all I did is come forward and indicate there's a problem in our building code that is causing blight and properties to go forward and be illegally remodeled and sold without any oversighting of the county. Mary Jane, thank you very much for pointing it out. But Thank you. We're going to get together with you and see what we can arrange, okay? Thanks. Thanks. Through the chair, um, I don't know if this is a possibility. Um, when the state abandons some aspect of their responsibility and there is an opening for uh, local jurisdiction to fulfill that responsibility, we can do that. Is that correct? If the state has abandoned that particular area? That's not a simple yes or no question. It, it really depends yeah. on 
um, what the area of law is. Um, the, the county always has the ability to go forward on health and safety. Um, as far as mobile home residency, as you can see by that manual, it's a, it's a fairly complicated thing, a uh, statutory scheme that the state has put in place. Um, but if they don't fulfill their responsibilities within the statutory scheme that they've delegated to themselves and those areas are not fulfilled, then that would be us that would then be the backstop for that? Uh, it, it, it's a complicated question. We're going right, to send, send somebody out there and take a look at, at this and address it. Is that right, Greg? Right. Kevin? That, that coupled with uh, re legal research as well. I understand. Well, unfortunately, we have to follow the law, unlike the other people. Yes. Okay. All right. I hope that helps, Mary. If not, come back. Call me. Call that guy. All right. Next card. Our next card is from Tony Farley. Seem work. Seem work. Here you go. All right. I'm 25 from South City in South Shore County, and I'm here to support Duke County. Commissioner Kevin, County Council, Lawyer, John Miskia, Andy Vance, Andy, Gray, Gary, Bradford, Seth Fuller, and Don Blazer. Here's Port Sheriff. Probation, DA, the county lawyers. Here's Port Red Cross over there. Caltrans, Cal Fire, name it. Here's Port Buddy. Thank you for your service. Our next card is from Tom McWhorter. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Tom McWhorter. I've met me before. Uh, this morning, I'd like to talk to you about the Brown Act. <clears throat> the Brown Act clearly states that supervisors determine whether the public can use the large TV screens in the chambers. The county departments can use them. Why does the board believe it is proper to stifle the impact public speakers have when exercising our God-given right? I challenge you to revisit and rescind the current restriction on our First Amendment right to speech. Cuba County residents pay for this resource. We are thoroughly dismayed at the callous attitude which previous supervisors chose to display. You were voted into office to make Cuba County residents' lives better. What better way to do that then increase the impact our voices, ears, and eyes have when improving the residents' living conditions. So please revisit that restriction your predecessors put in place where I cannot put a picture up there to increase the uh, impact my information that I bring to you has. Also on a little side note, as an example, when I provided pictures to all of you and to the county, and my supervisor directed Public Works to utilize them in their presentation, which occurred February 28th. My pictures were presented to the public in black and white. I don't take black and white pictures. Those pictures were not provided to the county in black and white format. Therefore, the pictures I presented to you were altered to lessen their impact. Would have been nice if I would have had the exact same opportunity to show the residents and you what I actually took a picture of. So please resend that uh, decision and allow us using a system which goes through the clerk of the board. So it goes through all the filters and everything. And uh, I'm sorry, I have 40 seconds like I've done the clock and also you didn't start the clock when that's right. And there are other speakers here before me who had lots of time before that clock started. So please don't pull that on me, Andy. Okay. 
We've still got time. If we need another clock that way, if you want to be such a clock watcher, that's fine. But uh, anyway, please rescind that vote and uh, thank you for your time. Our last card is, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, Mr. Ignatius Nemeka. We're going to go to county departments, uh, item 103, community development services, approved plan specifications, estimate, and authorized advertisement for bid for Spring Valley Road over Dry Creek Bridge. Good morning, board chair and fellow supervisor, Sam Button, assistant director for public works. Uh, you'll see a common theme for this item in the following two. They are all uh, approved plan specifications and estimate and authorized advertisement for bids. Uh, the following step after this will be to advertise for construction if approved and uh, come back to the board to recommend an award of a contractor. Uh, the first project is the Spring Valley Road over Dry Creek Bridge Replacement Project. And so a little background, uh, the de design started in 2013, so about 10 years ago. Super excited to, to get here today to, to potentially construct this summer. Uh, if we do construct uh, construction or if we do get approved, we will uh, construct this project summer and fall of this year. It's a one season project. Um, and then so for this, we're replacing an obsolete bridge originally built in 1920. It's a little 60 foot uh, four span bridge. And we are uh, proposing a bridge that is a single span 100 foot and it'll improve road alignments as well as uh, give us another 75 to 100 years out of the bridge. And then so the project estimate is a uh, Right now, the engineer's estimate is 3.3 million and is 100% funded by the Highway Bridge Program, or HBP as we call it. And so today, we recommend to the Board of Supervisors to plan plan or to approve plans, specifications, and estimate, and authorize the advertisement for bid for the Spring Valley Road over Dry Creek Bridge replacement. Any questions from the board? All right. Any questions from the board? Any questions from the public? Bring it back to the board. I'll move to approve. We have a motion. I'll second it. And we have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Measure passes unanimously. Thank you. And let's see, are you going to work the second one too? Yeah, I, I'll be Fifth here for now. Public Works for all three. Okay. Huh? Yeah, yes. 59 community development services, approved plan specifications and estimate and authorized advertisement for bid for Cedar Lane safe routes. Okay. Good morning, uh, board chair, fellow supervisor, Sam Button again, assistant director of public works. Uh, so this project was uh, an active transportation program award from a 29 or 2018 grant application that our director, Dan Peterson, our grant guru and expert applied for and got awarded. Um, the scope is to increase safety for biking and walking to schools in the disadvantaged community of West Linda. Uh, it'll construct sidewalks, shared bike lanes, crosswalk improvements, and drainage improvements surrounding Cedar Lane Elementary on uh, Cedar Lane from Alicia Avenue to Feather River, or uh, <laughs> sorry, get, getting my roads mixed up, um, on Cedar Lane from Alicia Avenue to Garden Avenue, and uh, on Alicia Avenue from Feather River Boulevard to Riverside. Um, the plans and specifications and estimate were all done in house by our engineers uh, in the engineering annex right over this way. And uh, construction is estimated if approved for uh, summer of this year. An engineer's estimate is 3.5 million, which uh, 2.7 million of that is from the ATP or Active Transportation Program Award. The remaining funds will be from the Water Agency and the Road Fund. And so today, Public Works recommends that the Board of Supervisors approve plans, specifications, and estimate and authorized advertisement for bid for the Cedar Lane Safe Routes of School Improvements Project. All right, any questions from the board? Any questions from the public? Bring it back to the board for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. We have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Measure passes unanimously. All right. 85. 85, community development, 
You're going to be up there for a while, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Approved plans of the 2023 overlay project. Wow. Awesome. So uh, third and final one from Public Works today. So uh, this uh, is our annual overlay project. Uh, a little background on kind of how we got here today. In 2017, California legislature uh, passed Senate Bill 1, a landmark comprehensive transportation funding bill. And uh, since then, uh, it began at an additional $940,000 to the department. And uh, by 26, 23 uh, fiscal year, which is about three years from now, uh, we're estimating an additional 5 million. And so that money has gone towards our annual uh, overlays uh, since 2018. And so this year we're proposing five miles of roads, uh, all of them but one, which is Laporte Road, is in the Arboga area. Some of the roads include uh, Arboga Road, Skyway, Plumas Arboga, uh, Fairway, and Dye Road. And so uh, this year, like I mentioned, it's uh, five miles. The engineer's estimate at this time is 3.7, about 3.7 million. And this money comes from uh, SB1 as well as uh, Measure D, which is the resource depletion tax that we get from the aggregate mining. And then uh, a little bit, about a half million from CSA 66 revenues. And so today, uh, Public Works recommends that the Board of Supervisors approve plans, specifications, and estimate and advertise award for the 2023 overlay project. All right. Any questions for the board? Through the chair, um, I do have one issue with the overlay project. So we're going to pay approximately $700,000 a mile. Um, but it seems that when we pay that, the shoulder packing doesn't always uh, prove truly effective. I know that when they did the overlay in my area of Olifers, uh, it descended into the uh, drainage ditches and caused blockages. Has there been any kind of improvements recently in how they've been doing the overlay so that isn't an issue? So uh, we can definitely keep a tight eye on it, and we do have full-time inspectors out there uh, following the project as well, uh, quantifying items, uh, inspecting to make sure that the construction's happening properly. And uh, if we get into the details of construction, I can always pull uh, Craig Herbert, our construction manager, as well. But uh, as of right now, uh, in the Olive First area, there are challenges with some of the roadside ditches are extremely close to the road, which doesn't give a whole lot of area for um, the shoulder backing to happen, as well as uh, it also sometimes proposes safety issues because it's hard to compact and those types of things. So we, uh, it is something that we have to do so there's not a couple inch lip, uh, which is also a safety issue off the road. But um, it is a challenge a lot of times when the roadside ditches are extremely close. What is the cost of, so an overlay is around 700 and change. What is the cost of the actual building of a road? Just out of curiosity, the comparison is it three times, five times as much? Oh, gosh. Um, let's see here. Uh, depending on if it has sidewalks or not, if it's just a roadway. This so is it's a, an Oliver, so yeah, that's Okay. So it, it is a tough one to answer off the, off the cuff, um, as well as it's heavily dependent on uh, oil prices because of asphalt is uh, directly tied to, to oil prices. Um, but so if it's about 700000 for an overlay, um, and I can come back with no clearer worries. information. Sorry. but. Um, Let's see, uh, trying to do some math in my head real quick. Usually about a million and a half to two million, I believe, per mile of road. Uh, but don't quote me. Yeah, uh, and it depends on uh, whether it's a new road or a rehabilitation project or those types of things. Uh, a good, if we do Goldfields Parkway Phase Two, which is from Northville Road to Hamilton's Martsville, that'll be a good test. Uh, it also depends on how wide it is and if there's drainage and those types of things. But uh, a good rule of thumb is, uh, I would guess, about a million and a half to two million. Mr. Chair, uh, does the public have access to a complete list, maybe by way of the website, of all the projects, even small projects? Sometimes there's inquiries about their small road that may only be a half a mile long, but just to see that it's on the, the projection. Yeah, so uh, we also have the transportation master plan that we put out. We're actually working on the right. next phase right now. Um, that is on the Public Works website. I could also pass a, uh, a link to it. Uh, but for the most part, and there are projects that come up uh, very quickly and happen as well, but uh, for the most part, that handles all of our projects that are currently funded, as well as uh, helps us plan for these types of annual overlays. But um, so uh, I would direct the public to the transportation master plan that we put out. Okay, thanks. Through, through the chair, I'll just add that um, if you Google Yuba County transportation master plan, it's actually the first thing that comes up on the list. So it's really easy to find. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. So. Okay. I, I Googled it just the other day, so that's that's how come I know. Thank you. All right. So we'll bring it. Any, any further questions from the public? Uh, we'll bring this back to the board. I'll move to approve. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 
Any opposed? Measure passes. Thank you. All right. County Administrator, adopt a resolution amending the travel policy of the Yuba County uh, Administrative Policy Procedures Manual. Oh, that. Uh, good morning, Board of Supervisors. Sean Powers, Assistant County Sean. Administrator. Sean. Uh, before your board today, we have a minor update to our travel policy. Your board may recall back in August of 2022, we did a major overhaul uh, to the travel policy, changing a number of uh, provisions, definitions, and methodology we use for reimbursement for county business travel. Um, we put that policy in place and let it run for about six months, and we went back and revisited, and we figured out a few areas needed some fine-tuning, as I would call it, so we made a, a few minor adjustments to it. We added one definition to talk about what the definition of in-county travel is, because we have a unique close proximity relationship with our neighbor to Sutter County, and also still made a provision to that if some extenuating circumstances came up for some reimbursement that the department head could discuss that with the CAO for approval. Uh, probably the most significance to the adjustment this time around would be to the per diem meal policy. We definitely reviewed some of that data that we had for the six months, and we have changed a little bit of the uh, time for when those adjustments kick in with the per diem rates, and also when things initiate, depending on what time the travel occurs. So um, we do consider this a minor update and more clarification to process those claims more efficiently and quickly. Um, Human Resources has reviewed this policy update with labor and uh, did uh, confer with it. And this was all done in collaboration with the CEO's office, the Auditor Controller's office, County Council, and Human Resources to make this update. Um, so with that, I'd be open to any questions from the board. Any questions from the board? Any questions from the public? All right. We'll bring it back to the board for a motion. I'll move to approve. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the measure, measure passes. Uh, board staff member reports. Don? Thank the <clears throat> Sheriff's Probation uh, for the quarterly update. And looking forward, to, apparently they're going to schedule some tours of the new juvenile hall in the next couple of months. Looking forward to that. OK. Seth? All of the public comment was about how all of Hearst needs more stuff. So I just want to reiterate and reemphasize that we are a community that needs more code enforcement, that needs more infrastructure, and needs drainage. Uh, and so we are prioritizing. Uh, I would love to see Hearst in the in front. Thank you. All right, Gary. Last week, I had the opportunity to uh, sit in with Ian Scott uh, on some presentations from the CPUC uh, that they're giving to counties around the state related to uh, broadband activities, various broadband funding. Uh, it was very informative uh, presentation, uh, and we were able to, to share with them what's going on here in Yuba County, and they were asked, able to ask us questions, and we asked them questions, and so it was extremely valuable. Um, the only other thing I would point out is Plumas Lake Elementary District is uh, extremely overcrowded right now due to all of the construction going on in Plymouth Lake and the new people moving to the community. Uh, and they have a survey up on their Facebook page. They're asking the community to fill out uh, to provide uh, some feedback on various short-term and long-term options to uh, deal with that challenge. So well, I'd encourage any Plymouth Lake residents to please fill that out. That'll teach you to take care of those builder bonds. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> Anything from you? Um, no, I, well, yeah, I, I have a few things. Okay. So um, went to the Conservancy Conference in Sacramento last week and uh, great things happening there and Fire Safe Council meeting last week in Oregon House Dobbins. Um, so I know nobody's thinking about fire season right now with all this rain, but it'll be on us in no time. So they're um, doing some great projects there and some grant things and then like to thank you all for the birthday wishes and card and, and um, snacks that are down back. I was trying to skip this birthday as, uh, along with the rest of them, trying to get younger instead of older, but you guys yeah. ratted me out a week late. Thank you. People say you can do anything with your mind to it, but you can't get younger. <laughs> uh, attended the uh, uh, March 3rd uh, uh, human trafficking course in 
in uh, at Yuba College. Very enlightening. Uh, and it's uh, the second time I've attended one of her, her presentations, Jenna McKay. And uh, it's something that we really all of us as supervisors need to get involved in and making sure that we we kind of address this situation and does nothing but get worse. Um, also, I found out a little interesting thing about a 457 that uh, cost me some money because uh, we changed uh, just just for a heads up for the board. Uh, your 457 is not really current because uh, there, there are forms they're missing and there are people that don't know the procedures and that they uh, dispersed some funds they weren't supposed to do. So you might look into that. I went, I talked to Human Resource, signed up for the 457 at Countywide and I have utmost faith in their, uh, their handling it. So, Kevin. <laughs> Just a couple quick things, and I had uh, forwarded an email that CSAC sent out on Sunday. Oh, yeah. uh, so CSAC has been one of their focuses is addressing homelessness. And uh, I mean, I, basically the gist of their new plan, they call it at home, is uh, clarity on roles and responsibilities statewide. Because frankly, the state has been creating one program after another. There's, it, it, it's, it's almost chaotic. Um, and then really Almost. define it. Well, okay. I was being polite. Uh, it, it is uh, chaotic on addressing homelessness and figuring out the state's role, the county's role, the COC, the cities, uh, for, for that matter, their roles. And so that I, I believe that's that's the, the, the focal point here for CSAC uh, and messaging back uh, to the to the governor and the state legislature. It's like, okay, as we move forward, we need clarity on the roles at all levels of government and frankly, clarity on the programs, because uh, it, it, Jen uh, Vasquez and I, we, we've, we've attended plenty of meetings and there's so many different funding sources and programs going on and you're trying to even map out, you know, does this one overlap with this one? Is it in parallel? How does it complement? You know, so anyways, I, I, I appreciate CSAC uh, pointing out, frankly, the obvious that, that it's, it's a bit of chaos on trying to address homelessness, but it is a very important issue statewide and um, something that I encourage the board to take a look at CSAC's uh, policy platform on this. And if there's an opportunity for us as a county to kind of support that, that the movement that CSAC's um, recommending here to, to, to push as far as we don't need more money. We just need clarity on how we're going to spend the money on everybody's roles and responsibilities. Well, the, uh, the governor's attitude is like the George Foreman commercial. It's not my problem, you know, and that's, that's what he's been saying for, months and throwing money at it. Uh, I think there's a uh, couple of uh, homeless uh, advocates out there that throwing money at it isn't working. In fact, I think it's out of Seattle where they have empty tents being being put up out there. So I, I would like for us to reevaluate our, our direction in homeless and see if there's a better solution. So I'd, I'd encourage the board members to take a look at the platform that CSAC's proposing and okay. that's something that resonates um, here uh, with, with Yuba County as well. Um, another uh, notable mention, um, our OES folks have been in constant uh, communication with our local partners on flood control, including the Yuba Water Agency. Um, they've been pushing out a daily uh, briefing so that, you know, a situational report. Uh, the, the, the one item that, and I, I think... It, it's it's going to pass with without issue, but there was a concern that the Yuba River, um, with the rain event that's happening right now, that it would uh, kind of the Yuba River would rise up enough that we would need to close Simpson Lane um, this t tomorrow. It doesn't appear that that looking at the forecasting that that's going to happen. The storm event is not going to be as severe as you know what was forecasted a few days ago, which is good news. It's going to get close though, and it's just one of those reminders that uh, you know that the Simpson Lane is a very important you know road corridor and 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 it's one of those there's definitely a community impact when we have to close that and it ha and it's been a number of years since we had to close it um, but we were preparing um, in the event that we were going to have to um, do that because the Yuba uh, moving up but uh, great partnership there with the, the reclamation districts ROES folks sheriff's department HHS every, everybody's isn't uh, Simpson Lane part of a setback levy uh, 
It, it, no, but it, it, Simpson Lane's within the floodway uh, between the city of Marysville and, and the community of Linda. Uh, but um, I, I just wanted the board to be aware that it, you know, we're, 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 there's, there's constant vigilance there on, on ensuring that we're, we're up to date on the information and, and, um, okay. and, and uh, making sure that the, the public's safe and that we have a plan to, to make the public safe. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out to the board, um, our strategic plan update. You know, the county's kicked that off. Um, we, I, I've asked our, I have a, a person helping kind of facilitate the process. Part of one of our first steps in this process is interviewing um, uh, the leadership. And um, I've asked um, him to reach out. He, he'll be coordinating um, with each of you to, to, to give him about a half hour. To He has a series of questions he'd like to ask you. And it'll help give us some some thoughts um, from, from uh, each of our board members. Um, in addition to that, we're also reaching out to to leaders in um, our cities, uh, leaders in nonprofits, the business community, et cetera, so we can kind of pull together information on their thoughts on, frankly, how, how the county's been performing and where they'd like to see see the county go. And uh, so we'll be asking the, the, each individual board member those those same questions uh, so we can start pulling together data. Um, one other item I wanted to uh, bring to the board's attention uh, it, staff has been um, actively engaged with our fixed base operator at the airport. Um, we have a meeting scheduled um, for next week to, to discuss more um, with with him. Uh, but uh, that was an issue that was uh, brought to the board, and I just wanted to make sure the board was aware that we're actively, you know, working through that issue and um, bringing it to uh, hopefully a productive resolution uh, for both the county and that and the fixed, fixed base operator. And I believe that's that's all I have uh, for this morning. Council. Okay. Could, all right. County Council. Yes. Oh, yeah. Or sorry. Did 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 you, you guys have any questions on what I reported out? Uh, through the chair, I just wanted to remind everybody too: the food trucks are back at the airport. <laughs> yeah. Had lunch there yesterday, so go out and support them. And very good, uh, very good food out there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nothing from our office. Through the chair, I have one additional item, if, okay. if that's all right, that I forgot about, and it's sure. before our next meeting. So uh, the board might remember that uh, several months ago, James Corliss, the executive director of SACOG, came before the board and talked a little bit about the blueprint that SACOG is working on. Essentially, the state and federal governments require uh, that SACOG put together a regional uh, land use and transportation plan that goes about 25 years out in the future. Uh, and that is something they're working on right now. Uh, they're seeking lots of public input on this. They've actually asked the legislature to extend the time frame um, that they have to put this plan together so that they can gather more public input. And there is an opportunity for um, locals to provide some public input to them next Tuesday, March 21st, from 6 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. at the North Beal Road Transit Center. Uh, by Walmart. So they'll have a pop-up out there and they'll be taking public input during that time. So I would encourage uh, anyone who wants to answer, uh, share. Uh, they're looking for, let us know what you value in terms of transportation, community growth, equity, and housing. So um, if folks in the community have input on any of those things, which I'm sure a lot of people do, that would be a great opportunity to share that with SACOG. Have they taken a look at the uh, general plan of what we're, that we're doing? Absolutely. One of the things that feeds into this plan is the general and specific plans from uh, all 22 cities and six counties in the region. And uh, that's where uh, some of the data comes from. But um, they obviously uh, want to look at, um, you know, public input. Uh, one of the challenges they face when they put together this plan is it is uh, financially constrained from a uh, transportation funding standpoint, so they can't just throw in anything and everything in there that jurisdictions ask for. At the end of the day, it has to equal the value that they anticipate to get uh, as far as funding goes from the state and federal government. And so one of the ways they help determine uh, what projects are in and out of the plan um, is based on uh, public input and actual anticipated uh, growth. Um, if they look at all uh, jurist, um, all 
general and specific plans within the region. Uh, those numbers for potential housing far outpace what's actually anticipated as far as growth in the region in the next 25 years. So they have to kind of say, here's where we anticipate some of the growth will happen and input from our community is very important to help shape that. So. My opinion. All right. Do you have anything else for me? Questions? Oh, we're not adjourning yet. Oh. Well, we're not going to adjourn until after closed session, though, right? We'll, we'll, we'll do it after closed session. All right, we're going to take a five minute break between the closed session and there are two items on the agenda, and that's so we'll adjourn. We're going to take a five minute break. Yuba Sutter.Live's local government live streams are presented by Plumas Lake Self Storage in Plumas Lake, where lifelong local residents are helping other residents keep things safe, providing indoor storage units, outdoor RV and vehicle parking, moving supplies, and Penske truck rentals. Details at PlumasLakeSelfStorage.com. Marysville Music Cafe with lessons in person and personalized instruments including guitars and amps horns strings strings for instruments and a myriad of music and sound equipment skips Marysville Music Cafe 